everyone, Squeaks and I were just about to go work on our garden. Gardening is one of my favorite things about summer. I love watching my plants go from tiny little seedlings to big, tall tomato plants, yummy carrots, and beautiful flowers. You're right, Squeaks. Playing in the dirt is pretty fun too. But you know, Squeaks, it's not just you and me out there gardening. We have thousands of helpers. We get lots of help from pollinators. Those are animals that help spread pollen from flower to flower. These are one of the most well-known pollinators. So let's watch this to remember how they do their job and why it's so important. It's summer where I live, and that means that it's almost time for some of my favorite kinds of fruit to be ready to eat, like strawberries, peaches, and cherries. And if you like fruit as much as I do, then do you know who you should thank for it? Bees! That's right, bees do more than just make honey. They play an important part in helping us enjoy all kinds of yummy fruits. How? Well, last time we followed a honeybee as she went about her day. And one of the things that we learned was that her most important job was to find and get food. She did this by flying around lots of different flowers and collecting some of their sweet nectar. Let's take a look at one of those flowers now. If we look really closely at the flower, we can see that it has lots of different parts. You probably already know the name of one of these parts. If you said petals, you're right. The parts on the outside of the flower are called petals. But have a look at this part inside the flower. It's called the stamen, and it makes a yellow dust that we call pollen. If you carefully touch the top of this part of the flower, some of the yellow dust will probably come off on your finger. Pollen can also make some people sneeze, especially if there's a lot of it. But if you want to have fruit, you have to have pollen because the pollen needs to travel from the stamen of one flower to a different part of another flower. And when it does, a tiny, tiny fruit will start to grow inside the flower. But where does the pollen have to go? It goes to this part of the flower called the pistil. It's kind of long and looks a little like a vase or a bowling pin. The very top of the pistil is kind of flat and it's covered with sticky, gooey stuff that's almost like glue. If pollen touches this gooey, sticky stuff, it gets stuck. Then, little bits of the pollen move down into the bottom of the pistil. And when that happens, the bottom starts to grow and swell up. It gets bigger and changes color, and the petals of the flower fall off. What's left is what we call fruit. So, to get fruit, it's important that pollen gets moved from the stamen of one flower to the pistil of another flower, and that some pollen gets stuck to the top of the flower's pistil. And this whole process is called pollination. And this is where bees come in. You might remember that bees get their food by drinking nectar from a flower. While a bee is moving around in a flower looking for that nectar, little bits of pollen from the stamen sticks to her legs, to her wings, and to her little fuzzy body. Then she flies off to another flower to get more food. And as the bee crawls all over the next flower, she bumps into the flower's pistil. So some of the pollen from the bee's body gets stuck to the top of the pistil. Then, if everything goes according to plan, in time, we'll get a nice piece of fruit. All of your favorite fruits start out this way, from tiny blueberries to giant watermelons. And bees aren't the only animals that pollinate flowers. Moths, butterflies, even bats and hummingbirds drink nectar from flowers. And when they do, they often carry pollen with them. But bees are some of the busiest and most important pollen carriers around. So the next time you enjoy a sweet summer treat like a peach or a cherry, you can thank a bee. Like I said, bees are one of the most well-known pollinators, but there are lots of others. There are butterflies, birds, and even bats that act as pollinators. Yep, bats. Here's Mr. Brown to tell us more about the wide world of pollinators and the plants that rely on them. <sighs> Squeaks and I just got back from playing outside and I'm really thirsty. With the straw in this bottle, I can get all of my water out of the bottle. Every last drop, its long skinny shape fits perfectly into the bottle. And hey, you know what that reminds me of? Flowers and their pollinators. Let me explain. So Squeaks, remember when we watched the butterflies in the fort's garden last week? We saw them flying from flower to flower. They were there to drink the flower's sweet, sugary nectar. But when the butterflies landed, they also got some dusty yellow stuff on their legs. 
That was pollen. And as the butterflies move from flower to flower, they spread that pollen around, collecting it from one flower and dropping it on another one. When an animal moves pollen from one plant to another, it's called pollination. And the animals that carry pollen are called pollinators. Some plants need pollination so they can make seeds. And new seeds can grow into... Right! new plants. So that means everyone wins. The butterfly gets a sugary drink of the nectar it likes, and the plant gets a little help making new seeds. What does that have to do with my straw? Well, I'm glad you asked. See, there are so many kinds of flowers, and they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. And there are all kinds of pollinators. There are butterflies, but also bees, bats, and more. And sometimes, these animals have body parts that make them great for pollinating certain flowers. Like, let's look at butterflies again. When we think of butterflies, we usually think of their pretty wings. But butterflies have another cool body part called a proboscis. A proboscis is a specially shaped part of their mouths that butterflies use to drink the nectar from flowers. It acts kind of like a straw, and it can look like one too. A butterfly can use its long, skinny proboscis to reach nectar even in flowers that are long and skinny, just like my straw could get to the bottom of this bottle. If a butterfly had a shorter or wider proboscis, it wouldn't be able to reach the nectar as well, or at all. <laughs> Isn't it cool? And there are all kinds of examples like this. Sometimes we can tell what kinds of flowers an animal pollinates by looking really close at their structure or the way the animal is shaped. So let's try another example. Squeaks, are you ready? Okay, let's look at the tube-lipped bat. This bat has a really, really long tongue. In fact, its tongue is longer than its whole body. So what do you think, Squeaks? What do you think the function or job of this super long tongue is? Do you think the flower it drinks nectar from looks flat and wide like this? Or tall and narrow like this? Right. The bat's long tongue can reach all the way to the bottom of the long flower, and the flower is big enough at the top so the bat can fit its head inside. And check it out! The part of the flower that makes pollen is also close to the top, so when the bat sticks its furry head inside, it gets covered in pollen. Then, when the bat flies away and goes to drink from its next flower, some of the pollen will fall off. <laughs> this is really fun. Let's do one more. This time, we'll look at the flower first. This flower is pollinated by a bird. Which bird do you think is the mystery pollinator? This one, with the short, thick beak. Or this one, with the thin, curved beak. <laughs> right again! The hummingbird's beak has a thin, curved structure so it can reach way down into the flower so the bird can get its yummy nectar. The flower's opening is just big enough for the bird's little head to fit in. So the hummingbird's head and body will get dusted with pollen, and then that pollen will fall off on the next flower as the bird looks for another drink. <sighs> huh. And speaking of a drink, I think I could use a refill. So now we know a lot about pollinators and how they do their work, but I think it's time we take a closer look at flowers. Flowers aren't just nice to look at and smell. Each part of the flower plays a special role in attracting the right pollinators, giving them nectar, and spreading its pollen onto them so they can take it away to another flower somewhere else. And a great thing about flowers is that you can take them apart and see all of those pieces up close for yourself. Squeeze just gave me the nicest Valentine's Day surprise ever, a bouquet of flowers. Flowers are fun to look at, and they usually 
smell great, but they actually have a really important job. They use their pretty colors and smells to attract animals, which help make new plants. If you've seen our episode about fruit, you might remember that some animals like bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and even bats move powdery stuff called pollen from one flower to another. These animals are called pollinators, and the pollen they carry helps flowers make the seeds that can grow into new plants. So that's a flower's job, to use its nice colors and smells to attract pollinators. Each part of the plant, from the long green stem to the beautiful petals, helps the flower do that job. And you can see how each part of the plant works if you look at it up close. Botanists, the scientists who study plants, will sometimes learn more about a plant by cutting it open and looking at the pieces. Squeaks, would it be okay if we took a closer look at one of these flowers? Great! You can try this at home too. All you need is a flower, a knife, and help from a grown-up, since you'll need to cut some things. The flower we're going to use is called a lily, but most other kinds of flowers will work too. The first thing you should do is separate all the main parts of the flower. Cut the flower off of the stem, then take off the leaves. Now that all the big parts are separated, you can take a closer look at each of them. The stem is really strong and stiff. That's because it needs to support the rest of the plant. The stem also connects to the roots of the plant. The roots suck Suck up water and nutrients from the ground, and the stem brings it to the leaves of the flower. This flower's roots were already trimmed off, which is why you can't see them. Another one of the stem's jobs is to bring food from the leaves to the flower. So let's look at the leaves next. Leaves grow out of the stem, and they're full of green stuff called chlorophyll. When the sun shines on the leaves, the chlorophyll turns sunlight into food for the plant. See those little lines running through the leaf? Those are veins, and they're a lot like the veins that move blood through your body. The veins in the leaf bring water and nutrients in from the stem, and they carry the food the chlorophyll made to the rest of the plant. So the stem and the leaves collect and carry water, food, and other nutrients that help the flowers grow and stay healthy. So now let's look at the flower. Flowers make a sugary liquid called nectar that pollinators love to eat. So to a pollinator, the flower's color and smell are like a big sign that says, there's lots of food here, come eat. If you pull the petals off the flower, you can see that there are these sort of long, dangly things left inside. They're called the stamen, and they make the pollen. When a pollinator finds a flower, it comes to eat nectar, and while it's eating, pollen from the stamen gets stuck to the animal. Then, when it flies off to get nectar from another flower, it spreads the pollen to that other flower, and that's pollination. Now, there's just one part left this sort of big stick thing called the pistil. That's the part of the flower that collects the pollen that pollinators bring from other flowers. It's kind of sticky on the end, so the pollen sticks to it. If pollen from another flower makes its way into the pistil, the pistil can use the pollen to make seeds. And then those seeds can eventually become new plants. So the next time you're outside, take a look at all the flowers around you. There are thousands of different kinds, but they all do basically the same job job. Mm, you're right, Squeaks. Lots of flowers smell really great. And they smell that way to attract pollinators. Their pretty color and their shape also help them attract pollinators. And we just happen to think that they look and smell nice too. But there are flowers out there that don't look or smell quite as nice to us. In fact, some of them smell like rotten meat and old eggs. It is gross to us, Squeaks, but to certain types of pollinators, they smell just as nice as any rose. Oh, hey guys, we're just watering these pretty flowers that Squeaks picked out. Tulips are my favorite flowers because they're just so pretty, but I like lilacs because I love the way they smell. What's your favorite flower? Some flowers smell good, like lilies and roses and lilacs, but not all flowers have smells that everyone would enjoy. For example, meet this flower, nicknamed Trudy. Trudy doesn't smell good at all. To be honest, it smells really, really bad. And in fact, it's been called the smelliest flower in the world. Some people say it smells like diapers. Others say it smells like rotting meat or old eggs. But even though Trudy doesn't smell so good, it still has a lot in common with other sweeter smelling flowers. For one thing, Trudy is a flower, a kind called a corpse flower. And like roses, lilies, and lilacs, a corpse flower is a kind of plant. 
It stays in one place, but it grows and changes just like you and I do. Plants can be small, like these lilies, or big, like a corpse flower. Trudy lives in a botanical garden in Berkeley, California, but it wasn't always this big. Like most plants, it started out as a seed in the ground. If the conditions are just right, a seed will split open and a part of the plant will push its way out. When plants do this, it's called germination, and it means a new plant is just beginning. The plant sprouts little roots that spread out and go down into the soil. Then the roots suck up water and food that the plant uses to grow. Now, lots of plants, like the corpse flower, grow flowers too, but not all plants do. If a plant happens to be a flower in kind, then it will grow a little bump called a bud. And as the plant grows, the bud slowly opens and its petals unfold. And voila, a flower has bloomed. But why does Trudy smell so smelly? Well, flowers are a really important way that plants use to reproduce or make new plants. They do that by attracting animals like birds, bees, flies, and beetles with their smell. When those animals get near a flower, they search for the source of its smell, looking for food. And while they're in there, they pick up a lot of sticky powder that's inside the flower called pollen. After the animals leave the flower, they then travel to other flowers, where they rub off the pollen that they are carrying from the first flower. When the pollen from the first flower rubs on the second flower, it can produce a new seed, which grows into a new plant. This is called pollination, and the animals that carry the pollen are called pollinators. But some pollinators don't just go for the sweet-smelling flowers like roses. They also like the stinky smell of flowers like Trudy. Insects like beetles and flies are especially fond of the corpse flower's stink. To us, it may smell like a dead animal, but to them, it smells like breakfast. And in addition to its weird smell, what's neat about corpse flowers is that they don't open up very often to let pollinators in. Some of them only bloom once every 10 years, releasing its nasty smell and then closing up again, sometimes in less than one day. That's why whenever a plant like Trudy blooms, lots of people light up to visit it, no matter how bad it smells. So even if a flower smells really bad, it's still doing its job, helping a plant make new plants, even if it is stinky. Ooh, Squeaks is wondering if there's any way that we can help pollinators in return for them helping us with our garden. That's so nice, Squeaks. There are lots of ways to help pollinators. We can plant plants native to our area and avoid using pesticides in our garden that will kill butterflies and bees. But I do know of something else that we can do right now to help certain bees. We can build them a place to make their nest. Let's watch this to learn how. It's almost summer where we live, and my garden is looking pretty nice if I do say so myself. And it looks like there are lots of bugs and birds who agree. Let's see, we've got butterflies, hummingbirds, ooh, some ants, and look, there's a bee busy gathering nectar. Do you remember what we learned about bees the other day, Squeaks? You're right, they collect the sweet nectar from flowers, and as they fly from flower to flower, they also do another important job. They spread little fluffy pieces called pollen. When pollen from one flower gets into another flower, the plant can make more seeds to grow into new plants. So bees can be really important for plants to make new baby plants, which means they're great for keeping our garden healthy and growing. We want to attract even more bees to our garden, so we're going to build a bee house, and we can find most of the the supplies we need in our recycling bin. What's that, Squeaks? It doesn't look like a beehive to you? Hmm, you're right, it's not a beehive. A lot of bees do live in big hives like this. These hives have lots of bees working together to collect food and make more bees. These kinds of bees build their own homes out of the wax they make from honey. They lay their eggs in the hive to keep them safe. But there are also lots of bees that live on their own instead of in a big group in a hive. The mason bee is a type of bee that lives on its own, and that's the kind of bee we're building a house for. Mason bees are really common in the northern part of the world, like in North America, Europe, and Asia. So if you live in a place where there are mason bees, you can build a bee house for them too. The house will give the bees lots of good hiding places to lay their eggs. Normally, they look for holes in trees or cracks in rocks or anywhere they can squeeze right into. Once they find a good hole, they gather nectar and store it in the hole, pollinating lots of plants along the way. Then they lay their eggs with the stash of nectar, seal up the nest with mud, and go out looking for another space to hide more eggs. When the baby bees hatch, they spend the winter in the hole eating up the stored up nectar, growing into strong, healthy adult bees. And in 
the spring, they chew through the mud and finally go out into the world. Sometimes it's hard for mason bees to find a place to lay their eggs, but a bee house is full of little tubes of paper, perfect for a bee to build its nest. Mason bees hardly ever sting, so as long as you don't bother them, they probably won't bother you. But some people are allergic to bee stings, so check with a grown-up before you build your bee house. Here's what you'll need to build your bee house. A clean tin can with the top cut off, a whole bunch of scrap paper, a pencil, tape, some toilet paper rolls, and some glue. First, cut your scrap paper so it's a little shorter than the can, like this. Roll up the scrap paper around the pencil. Try and wind each piece of paper around the pencil at least five times. The walls need to be thick so the baby bees stay warm over the winter. Tape the paper, take it off the pencil, and then start wrapping the pencil with more paper. You'll need about 30 little tubes of paper to fill the can. Once you have a lot of little tubes made, I already made mine, cover the bottom of the can with some glue, like this, and then put the two toilet paper rolls into the can. The rolls are in here to keep the little tubes from rattling around too much. Fill in the empty space around the toilet paper rolls with tubes first. Make sure they stick really well to the glue and add more glue if you need to. Then fill the rolls with even more tubes. Keep going until everything fits snugly, but the tubes aren't squished together. Then find a sunny spot about three feet off the ground to put your bee house. Have a grown-up help you attach it really well to the spot you pick. You don't want it to wobble around or fly away in the wind. Now watch and wait for mason bees to move right in. If bees do start laying eggs in your bee house, you'll probably see the paper tubes plugged up with mud, like this. It means there are baby bees inside, growing and getting ready to leave the nest in the spring. It's very important that you don't touch or move the bee house. It's dangerous for you and for the bees. If your bee house attracts some bees, next year your garden will be buzzing with lots of helpful critters. All right, Squeaks, are you ready to get out there and start gardening? Great, and while we're at it, we can thank all the bees and butterflies we see for all of their hard work. Thanks for joining us today. If you wanna keep learning, growing, and having fun with Squeaks, me, and all our other friends, be sure to hit the subscribe button, and we'll see you next time on SciShow Kids.